What's up everyone? This is Michelle Short. I am the chapter head of the Satanic Temple in Arizona and you are listening to the Naked Diner Podcast. been a day it's been an uneventful day you know really is that how this is it's been an uneventful day no, dude came and got his ds out of my car i'm going to see henry rollins tonight everything's fine everything's good in the world right is that what you're telling me apparently i get to get my picture taken with it oh that's nice you have to pay for it well i when, when the sh- when i found out about the show the only tickets were, that were available were the vip tickets so i got them how much they cost you? Uh, more than they should have. Whatever. A couple hundred, like what, a couple hundred for both yeah, of them? Yeah, probably yeah. not right. So have you listened to the interview I did with I, Stefan? I have not at all yet, no. <laughs> Dare it. <laughs> okay. Is there shit that I should watch out for? Eh, I don't think so. Do you have I think notes? we have. <laughs> Um, no, no, no. It was pretty much a straight, you know, um, rapid fire, um, kind of interview. I think, it, I think it, I remember it went well. I actually learned. Maybe I should just start in with the intro. How's that? What episode are we doing, Chico? Yes, this will be 58. All right. <clears throat> hey, everybody. This is Andy Hall of the Naked Dino Podcast. And today we have a fantastic guest. He is a writer. He has written many novels. He has written many graphic novels. He has written comic books. He has done all of those things, and his name is Stefan Petruka. And with me, as always, is Jack Viterko. Hello, well, Jack. Well, I'm, I'm here for the intro. I'm not here for the actual interview. This is this is a rare thing, Andy. This, is, this was a situation where you managed to do the entire episode on your own because I was busy doing another shit. And I'm proud of you, really. You, you handled the technical aspects of it like a champ i was able to hit the right buttons i i i i I had to walk you through it but you managed to make it happen and i'm i'm very very pleased with with your progress as a technical person i i'm not i'm an anti-technical person i hit my i hit the keys with a simian like you know knuckles yeah that's that's, that's why you keep me around <laughs> I, I, I'm sorry. I, I couldn't think of anything uh, clever or sincere at that point. So I'm just, that was just pregnant pause. That's fine. But I had a really good conversation with Stefan. We talked about story writing. We talked about the differences between writing a, let's say, a script and, or a short story or, and a graphic novel. We talked about common mistakes writers make. Um, Stefan's a really talented guy. He teaches classes online for the University of Massachusetts. Nice. Yeah, yeah. I met him actually at an independent comics expo with my kids a couple of months ago. Oh. And he was on a panel discussion about teaching comics in an academic sense, in, a, in an academic arena. Because, you know, comics are – it's a big business. There's money to be made. And writers who aspire to a no, career there's, – Well, there's definitely room to teach that stuff in an academic sense. I mean, comic yeah. books are – they're like that weird bridge gap between literature and movies. It's yep. always how I've thought about them. And, and the, there's stuff you can do in comics that doesn't work in text but also doesn't well, we, work in We film. talk about that. Yeah. We, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. We talk about that. We talk about what are the differences um, when you. What's the difference between like when you watch a movie as against to reading a book? And everyone, you know, my writing actually, as I'm writing through another, as I'm writing another horror short story, I believe that my writing has gotten better from my conversation with Stefan. That's excellent. Yeah. Yeah, and if people, if our listeners are writers or want to be writers or want to make some money writing, this is the episode you should listen to. Excellent. Excellent. I have not listened to it yet, folks. I I still have to cut it together tomorrow because that's how I roll. So what have you been up to, Jack? Are you going to go see Henry Rollins tonight? I am going to go see Henry Rollins tonight. It's going to be amazing. There are Uh, bands, there are people who I go see whenever I get the opportunity. And the two that rank the highest on that list are Henry Rollins and Weird Al Yankovic. Oh, Weird Al, yeah. 
And any opportunity to see those people do their thing, I am there. So you should totally suggest to Henry Rollins when you see him tonight to go on tour with Weird Al Yankovic. Oh, man. Yes. I don't even know what you would call that tour, but it would the, be pretty awesome. The Wait album polka would just be my favorite thing <laughs> ever. How did it feel doing a one-on-one interview? Well, that's a, that's a good question. The good thing about Stefan is, just like with all of our guests, is that you know when people come onto the Naked Diner, they are professionals, and they typically have a huge wealth, a huge water supply, an underground water supply maybe, I don't know what I'm saying, an oceanic supply of knowledge. And what the trick is, is to try to concentrate these pearls of wisdom that they have into an hour-long discussion. And I think... I think I did a good job, but it was only because Stefan was there, because he's a great guest. Sounds yeah. promising. I look forward to listening to it, as I'm sure all our listeners do. Yeah. Let's do it. So just to let you know, this is an edited show. This isn't live, of course. My uh, co-host, who is right now in the middle of the desert in Arizona, doing some kind of Trump resistance protest rally thing going to get the files and clean everything up and make us both sound well he won't have to make you sound any more intelligent or awesome than you already are huh. me there'll be some work involved that sounds great don't take me out of context <laughs> of course of course oh no 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 <laughs> so, so Stefan, what's it like to have the coolest job in the world at least that's what it sounds like to me for what you do wow uh uh I, it would be a lot cooler if I could pay my bills. I mean, I have the advantage of <laughs> I have the advantage of doing what I like uh, a lot of the time, but also doing a uh, a is bastardized an okay word to use. Oh um, yeah, yeah, we curse all the time. In fact, you know, we okay. actually have a swear jar, and that the more you <laughs> swear and the more I swear, we actually give money to charity. Oh, cool. So uh, fucking swear all you want. <laughs> I, I, I fucking try to do that. Um, but uh, it's I, it's great to be able to do what you want. Often I'm doing sort of a bastardized version of what I, I want to be doing. So uh, the coolest job in the world would be if one of my uh, weirder, uh, stranger projects became enough to support me. So I have a, a semi-cool job. But it beats the hell out of uh, commuting or having oh, a yeah. in an office. I'll, I'll grant everyone that. Right, right, because you've written, like, what, hundreds of comics, graphic novels, and, what, at least 20, I was reading, regular, everyday novels. Uh, 20, yes, 20 books. I have one nonfiction book uh, on Paranormal State, if you want to call that nonfiction. Mm-hmm. I've done, like, 500 Mickey Mouse stories uh, for Egmont Publishing in Denmark. Uh, dozens of other uh, graphic novels going back to, uh, I think I broke in with a Spider-Man story in 1997. Mm-hmm. Had a bunch of my own characters through first publishing, if you remember them. I remember first publishing. I was interested in Grim Jack back then. Oh and, yeah, John uh, Ostrander. Yeah, yeah. I was really into that and I really liked um Lone Wolf and Cub. Lone Wolf? Yes, yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Jeez, uh, one of if not the first manga to be uh sold and, and translated in the United States. I don't know if it's the, but it was fairly popular when it started. So Yeah. They were responsible for that case. I came in sort of towards the end when they were running out of money. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But I did uh, – Squalor was the first work I did with them with Tom Sutton, uh, who sadly sure. is no longer with us, and Metaphor, mm-hmm. which I did with Ian Gibson, who was worked for 2000 AD in, uh, in the UK. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And so then how, a year oh, no, later, they were out of business. What? A year later. <laughs> Well, there was no causality between you working for them, starting to work for them, and then... I certainly hope not. (laughs) So how uh, young were you when you started writing? When I started writing or when I started writing professionally? When you started, well, I I think for a lot of authors, they start writing at a very young age. Yeah, that would be around 10. Well, what? Yeah. If uh, if you, you know, when I just started writing, because I just kind of had a knack for it, it was easy. Um, My best friend lived across the street, Jim Selabrup, who now runs... Was worked for Marvel and everybody else, and now runs uh, Paper Cuts. Yeah, uh, uh, was a great artist to my eye. He could draw these fantastic caricatures, and I couldn't draw to save my life. But I uh, discovered that I could write. That it was fun to throw sentences together. <laughs> and then we started, you know, reading all sorts of literature and stuff as things went on, 
and hopefully progressed in both my style and content. Uh, professionally, what? Uh, I started off as a tech writer after, uh, you know, some temp jobs and stuff after college. Mm -hmm. uh, broke in with a Spider-Man story and then didn't do any uh, comic book work for about four years until I sold Squalor to first publishing. And that was mm -hmm. 97. Right. So I was uh, in my 30s, thereabouts. But I'd done, you know, sure. I'd done a lot of uh, unprofessional stuff. In college, I did six hours worth of video satires. And, uh, in the, uh, really? So what were you satirizing back then? I, I, I wanted to get out of doing a, this is like 1977. And I wanted to get out of doing a paper for a class called the language of social control. And he, the mm -hmm. teacher, Professor Stack, who I love dearly, um, said people could do a video. So I did a, we had studied Charlie's Angels in the class. So I oh did my. a satire of Charlie's Angels called Chadwick's Airheads. And then, <laughs> and then did a sequel, because it went over really well, called Afternoon of the Airheads, which was a satire not only of Charlie's Angels, but of George Romero and campus politics at the time. We were uh, <laughs> not one of the last anymore to come, but we were one of the, the last at the time who was a student body that had taken over its administration building. So I did a satire of that, and I had different people playing the president and such, and the uh, the airheads were involved. And then I spent like two years doing the third one, which was Chadwick's Airheads, the motion picture. And that satirized everything from Star Trek to Lord of the Rings to The Prisoner and Planet of the Apes. Had a cast of about that's, 100 people. Wow, that's that sounds like an, an, a lot of work considering – the time period that you were working in, you know, during the seventies, this wasn't computerized, you know, you oh, actually no, had, a, you had a cut film. We built crappy looking models. Uh, <laughs> we didn't have any computer control. I, I didn't have color for the first two. Uh, so, and you edited by backwinding the tapes. These were yep. like reel to reel recorders and you had to press play at the uh, first at the same time and then hit the record button when you hoped the cut would cut in. This is very <laughs> crude relative today. And when I see all the wonderful computer editing going on now, so cheaply with so 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 many great effects available i weep <laughs> yeah 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 it's uh must be half the time or a tenth of the time that it would have that it took you back in the day yeah, a hundred <laughs> <A hundredth. laughs> so were you an english major yes yes people thought i was a film major but i was not somehow managed to That's get it. english credit for writing the scripts sure sure were you um, interested in writing comics back then? I uh, loved comics from the time I was a child, a child, six, seven. That's how I learned to read mm -hmm. and then stopped around the time Gwen Stacy died because mm -hmm. uh, it was just crushing mm -hmm. and uh, then dropped it for about five years and picked it up again when things got interesting. Uh, when you know Frank Miller started doing Daredevil and you know, Watchmen came yeah. out later. So I, 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 I dove back in after that. I, I never thought of myself as a comic book writer, more as just a writer. But yeah. then I heard that uh, Jim Shooter, was willing, who was editor of Marvel, was willing to listen to new plots. And I managed to impress him enough to uh, get a couple of tryout stories through Marvel, which went absolutely nowhere. <laughs> uh, they, you know, they gave them, he gave them to an artist and the, as, as the artist tryout, didn't hear from him for a year. You know, meanwhile, I'm, I'm like working at Caldors or something like that. And so that eventually burned me out until I tried again uh, with uh, things like Squalor and the uh, later Spider-Man script. Sure, sure. Were, Were your, your parents, parents in the arts? Were my parents? No, no. My, my dad was an electrical engineer and my mother worked as a probation officer, although she originally worked as a school teacher and a, um, prior to that, she worked in a, in a lab as an assistant. I don't know exactly what they did there. But they were both very smart, very funny people who uh, were very well read and uh, interested in things like that. Although my mother, until her dying day, wished I had yeah. become a lawyer or a doctor. Oh. <laughs> so what does your normal day look like? Because you, you, you crank out so much material. I just imagine that you're, you're uh, tied to your computer at all times. Well, lately, pretty much, because I also teach online classes. Right. And this semester, for the first time, my writing class, since I'm not a, I've only got a BA. I don't have mm -hmm. a master's or anything. So while I teach the classes through UMass, it was only recently that they let me teach my writing class to the writing department. So all of a sudden, while I was working on a, a, a Spider-Man novel for Marvel, yeah. I had like 30 students at the same time. 
as well as writing a couple of graphic novel scripts. So it's been really a very particularly hectic period. Usually I can comfortably balance two projects and a class, and that takes up, I don't know, six hours out of the day. Mm -hmm. uh, my preferred way of working is to become completely obsessed about something, yeah. throw myself into it for a long period of time, and then recover when it's done. But uh, reality and paychecks don't allow that to happen. <laughs> no, 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 I imagine that they don't. So tell me about your online classes. What are you doing? I have two classes currently. One is called uh, Writing for a Living, which uh, you, are you still there? Because my screen just went asleep. I am here, yes. Okay, good. So I don't have to worry about my sleeping screen. You, you don't have to worry about it. Though I obsessively touch mine to make sure it doesn't sleep, but that's more of an anxiety disorder thing, Stefan. I, I share that as well. But as long <laughs> as I hear your voice, I'll assume I'm talking to someone. Yes. Uh, <laughs> uh, the online, uh, the writing for a living class is about basically writing queries mm -hmm. and learning how to sell your work. I've seen tons and tons of classes on how to write, how to do fiction, how to do structure, how to do character. But there wasn't anything about that basic ability to pitch, right. write press releases, know what's involved, talk about copyright. So what I do with that class is I split everybody up into two or three publishing groups and they write queries and then we send them, they send them to each other and they have to review wow. them as editors and accept one and reject the others and then write rejection letters to everybody who hasn't been accepted. So it, I, I hope, and my students tell me that it provides not only a, a way to uh, a concentrated way to summarize your ideas in a clear fashion. It also gives you a sense of what the process looks like from both ends. Sure. Do you have to prime your students to not write really nasty rejection letters? Uh, we, you know, before that we have a discussion on etiquette. And, you know, how does it feel when you get rejected? So yeah, pretty much. And you see that their their ability to write query letters is significantly better by the end of the class, I imagine. Yeah, by and large. Yeah, summary summarizing is something that writers hate to do because. You know, you write a you write a novel because you don't like to write short things, and you don't want to take your beautiful, gorgeous ideas and kind of boil them down into two sentences. But it becomes necessary when you want to if you want to sell them. Sure, you sure. Want to sure. Another question. Of, of so, art. so can you talk about the different kinds of rejection letters? Because I know that there are different types of rejection letters, and that, and some are better than others. <laughs> Back at Marvel, I had a script returned to me with the uh, uh, words uh, "mindless yak yak." <laughs> on every page, on every one of 26 pages that I spent, you know, sl you know slaved over. Uh, that would be on the bad end. <laughs> My I God. I that somebody had that stamp. <laughs> My degree <laughs> was yak yak. Uh, so that, you know, that was not a great relationship, but at the time it was my only relationship with any editor. So I pursued sure. it until I just kind of threw my hands up. Um, Jim Shooter's uh, feedback on my stuff was personal and uh, you know often you just kind of how dare you not like me you know but uh, it, and he could be kind of uh, pointed with his remarks but they were they, that was helpful yeah um, yeah you know and then that's one of the things I try to get people to accept because it's inter interestingly enough they're polite with their uh, students are polite with their rejection letters but they don't always take them very well even if they're polite uh, all of a sudden sure. it becomes much more real. Uh, the, you know, the best rejection letters are, are have been the ones that have acknowledged that, you know, you're, you're clearly you're a great writer. We're just not buying this. You know? uh, yeah. That kind of thing, or that give you some sort of specifics to go on. And right. I haven't had a, a bad rejection in, uh, uh, you know, since, I, since I've established a professional career. You tend to be treated a little differently. Sure. At, at the same time, sometimes you just get ignored, and that, that'll drive you crazy. So that's a, a bad rejection is the one uh, at this stage where you never hear the other shoe drop. Yeah, silence. Yeah, that yeah. sucks. I mean, just no is fine. <laughs> <laughs> I was reading through Stephen King's memoir, I don't know, years ago, and I on recall writing? on writing. Yeah, yeah, and, and and I I remember reading that he took all of his, you know, early on he took all of his rejection letters and just pasted them or, or thumbtacked them. Yeah, the yeah, wall. I think he had a a, a letter stabby thing. Yeah, a letter stabby thing, right? Exactly. Where he would sacrifice them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So do you have a do you have the a time of day that you're best at uh, creating at at executing copy uh, writing? Is there a special time of day? It varies about what's going on. I mean, until until last year, I was waking up with the kids, uh, or at least my my youngest, Margot, to uh, go to school, and that was good for her because I made her breakfast, and good for me because it got me out of bed. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, probably 10 to 1 hmm. would be my strongest hours. 
after right. a little bit of listening to NPR or, or, or whatever, and get I, you know, steamroll it into then. But it really varies. Uh, now that I'm more on my own, I, I tend to deal with the class in the morning and hit the writing in the afternoon. But most often, what I feel most energetic about is is whatever I do first. Yes. You kind of peter out. Although to be fair, when I bounce back and forth between projects, like say I'm writing a fairly simple graphic novel for uh, you know some Nickelodeon show or something, and a uh, complex novel, moving from one to the other is energizing because it's a relief. Sure. Now, on sure. the one hand, I'm not trying to think of these complicated descriptions and you know how they connect to God, the universe, and everything. <laughs> and, and and then I can and go, gee, that was stupid. Why'd you do that? You know, on uh, on the other hand, for the for the graphic novels, so that that balance can provide its own energy. Sure, sure, definitely, definitely, I can see that. When you're writing a novel, and let's say that that's the only project you're working on, do you have a set number of pages that you want to crank out a day? Yeah, I I keep a uh, well. If it's just, it generally isn't just for myself. I usually I've sold something based on a partial or something like that. Uh -huh. And uh, then I have a due date and I know sure. to hit the, and I'm going to want two weeks to revise it and another week to revise it a final time. So that there's a page count that uh -huh. evolves from that based on what I'm, you know, 80,000 to 110,000 words for a novel. So I, I try to hit that, but some days I'll hit more and some days I'll hit less. I mean, I follow my muse whenever he or she shows up uh, and continue going. So, uh, but, but yeah, I do keep track of it in terms of a uh, number of pages. Sure. You were talking about, uh, reviewing and rewriting. Is that one of the things that you've come to love or is that something that you just have just learned how to tolerate? Well, just as a tricky question, cause you know, I, I'm 57. So, uh, mm -hmm. I think in the last 10 years I've really enjoyed editing oh, really? My own stuff. It's a, it, you know, it was, it took me a long time to learn this, but it's really a completely different process it, and you have to remove yourself from the content and ask yourself, is this being expressed the best way? So it becomes mm. more like a crossword puzzle where you try sure. to construct better paragraphs and you try you know, to eliminate redundancy, which was one of the biggest issues with writing and, and, and uh, things I've seen with my students. Just well, tell me more about that redundancy. Uh, okay. I, I, uh, I don't know if anybody else has done this, but I, I, for the class, I break it up into three different categories. There's like a, there's a core redundancy, which is simply the repetition of a word in the same sentence, like the mm -hmm. Department of Redundancy Department, or the Red Red Barn. Uh, and uh, the second kind is more about um, content, mm -hmm. like saying, you know, he pushed his feet really quickly beneath him as the ground sped, period. He ran. Uh, so wow. you, you know from the first thing that he ran, so you really don't have to say it again. And right. the last one is context, uh, contextual redundancy. Where, for instance, um, you start off a letter, uh, dear so-and-so, I am writing today to tell you. Yes. Uh, and yes, of course you're writing. Of course you're writing it when you wrote it, and it's to tell somebody something. So that's a contextual redundancy. And between those three things, uh, though the, I, I see those as the, as the, the biggest uh, obstacle to clear, concise writing. Yeah. With the caveat that using redundancy consciously is can be important. I mean, you get something out of the red red house, or, you know, mm. or uh, Edgar Allan uh, Poe's The Bells is the example I always yep. use. You know, the rolling of the tell bells, silver bells, and it's bells, 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 bells. But it creates a, a different sort of effect than simply conveying information. It's more a resonance and poetic thing. So, you know, fine to use. Just be conscious of using it. Right, because it sounds like beginning writers have a tendency of just doing those redundancies without thinking about it, just like a bad habit. Oh, when I rewrite my own work, that's most of what I'm cutting out too. Hmm. Because when you're in that kind of free flowing first draft state and yeah. just kind of going with everything, you tend to repeat things because that's how you think. Yeah. That's how you, how you talk. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. True enough. Then, True enough. So, go ahead. So when you think, if you're going to do a pie chart, because I like pie, all types of pie, but if you're going to do a pie chart Probably. on how much, on how much time you and energy you spend on um, editing versus doing the first draft and and thinking about it and outlining? How, how do you think that break? How, what percentage do you think you spend editing? Time wise, yeah, uh, twenty five seventy five. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. most of it's about writing writing the thing, but that doesn't make the twenty five percent any any less important. And it really is a a, a more of a skill than than a, a, a talent or a drive or something like that. 
So in a way, it's much more relaxing uh, and doesn't have the emotional highs and lows of, of, uh, of writing the, the book itself. Sure. So, so it's, a, it's a very different kind of work and a different, a different kind of mindset. And in fact, when I, you know, like uh, the Spider-Man novel I just handed in started at close to 90,000 words. And by the time I just finished my, my first edit, it was down to 75,000. Wow. So, and I, I've cut things by a third and people don't realize what's missing. Sure. Sure. Well, well I imagine if you're cutting the fat off, then, yeah, yeah. then, then people don't well, notice. You know, for myself and I've edited other people's work too. Sure. Have you ever looked at yourself, you know, like, you've been doing this for a long time. No, I never look at myself. <laughs> That's okay. I'm not here to judge. I'm not here to judge. I'm not. But you're looking at your own work after you, you know, you're editing it. And have you ever just thought to yourself, what the hell was I thinking about? No. <laughs> that's good. That's good. <laughs> I've written, God knows I've written bad stuff, but I just say, well, that's bad. Uh, and then I cut it out and do something else. There's one thing, a lot of people suffer from writer's block, but one thing I did very early on was I gave myself permission to write whatever shit I felt like. You know, so it's never been a blank page because I knew I could always change it later. That's a good lesson. That's a good lesson. So how how important is it to outline? I think it's crucial. I think if you don't outline, you're abandoning a lot of important writer's tools like, uh, oh, what's the gosh darn word I'm looking for? Where you set, you seed something early on. Uh, uh, foreshadowing. Foreshadowing. Yeah, foreshadowing. <laughs> Character arcs and things like that. At the same time, while I do outline, I never consider myself wedded to the outline. The outline evolves as it goes along and as I discover things about the characters and how the story could work better. So sure, sure. The outline is, is written, but not in any sense in stone. Right. But, you know, well, I, you, you hear writers who say, oh, the characters write themselves for me. Or, They've taken over my book. That's never happened to me. I keep them in complete control, and if they ever did try to take over, I would kill them. <laughs> I imagine with your ability to write so much, do do you find yourself um, sticking to a to a formula? Formula seems like a uh, a diminution, a uh, and not so much a formula, but there are elements that a story has. Hmm. There, there's no, I don't care if it's waiting for Godot or or whatever. It's there's going to be a character, whether it's human or not, or a concept. There's going to be a conflict, and that doesn't have to be a fight. It can just be waiting for an elevator. Or pondering your, your existence in the universe, and there's going to be some sort of you know closure or solution or resolve or way of ending it or waiting of you know waiting for Godot. The closure is when the audience realizes that there isn't going to be a closure. Uh, uh -huh. And if you look at those three elements, it becomes easier. Uh, and and think in terms of juxtapositions, it becomes easier to generate plots and stories. And the you know, the challenge creatively can then become making those the story moments come alive sure but you know however, however you do that so if you're aware of the skeleton versus the muscle it makes the process easier right right what do you think do you think that that if you can write a novel then it's automatic it you're able to write a graphic novel and, and if you're able to write a no. short story are you able to write a comic no <laughs> They're, they're, they're very what are the differences? I will, because... I will say, if you're able to write a screenplay, you can write a graphic novel. Oh, that's interesting. Tell me more about that. I, I'm, I'm curious. Except, about... you know, the pictures don't move. Yeah. Well, yeah. In, in, in comic books, the the you, you, you're relying on the uh, you're relying on you have visuals, <laughs> and you have to know how to describe them to an artist in a full script anyway, that gets sure. across what you want it to look like and have it you know match the words. And that's very different from prose, where a lot of the focus is always is more on or shifts freely between internal and external perspectives. So if you're a novel writer, you wouldn't necessarily be used to breaking something down into a graphic sequence and vice versa. If you're a comic book writer, you're not necessarily going to know how to do a descriptive passage uh, that's not geared to an artist where you'll say, you know, hey, Joe, give me a close up of so and so and his eyes are really big or something like that. Yeah, you, know, you have to because you don't have the picture. You have to do it in a way that evokes it in an interesting manner in the prose. Uh, I uh, I tend to use the examples uh, uh, in terms of the different strengths the medium have, and I think I mentioned this during the, the panel you saw me on. Oh yeah, yeah. That uh, if uh, if if you see an explosion in a film, you really you, you feel it and you mm. see it, and it unfolds in time, and you can be shaken in your chair. You can have a really great drawing of uh, or a photo of an explosion, 
but it's not quite the same as, as a film. And in a prose, you can uh, describe really accurately how someone feels being in an explosion, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but it doesn't have that same physical impact. In a comic book, uh, even if you just have the, uh, the great drawing of the explosion and then there's a little caption that says, ow, you're doing this wonderful little combination of the two. Right. That uh, appeals to different different sort of uh, resonances. Not that that, you know, but you get certain things out of each medium and your ability to work with those things determines how successful you are in that medium. Sure, that sure. Uh, I, I, I'm guessing that you must have seen some of the uh, comic book movies. Oh, have been, yeah. 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 So, so what do you, what, I mean, <laughs> what's that? Ghost World. Yeah. yeah. Paradise Road. Uh, <laughs> And that I'm stuff actually going to. Yeah, go ahead. No, go ahead. And that, that stuff with this, the capes. <laughs> the capes, right, right, right. So, as a person who writes graphic novels, as a person who writes comics, and, and obviously you've had some experience still in uh, screenplays too, just from your uh, college years and everything. And when you look at this, when you look at them in the theater, how, what are you thinking about? You're thinking about plot. You're thinking about dialogue. What are you? How are you processing it? I, I, I think about all that stuff no matter what I'm reading or, or writing or seeing on TV. I'm always like, you know, if the dialogue's lousy on the news, I'm editing it. I'm going to say, oh, you could have left that part out. Uh, and it's very hard for me to find a book that I really enjoy reading because I'm, I'm part of me is consciously editing it. But to specifically <laughs> for the superhero movies um, and, and that sort of thing, the thing that makes them fail the most for me is when people don't know how to write action scenes when they don't think of them as stories in and of themselves and think of them as two characters just hitting each other harder and harder and then throwing bigger and bigger things at each other until one falls down or someone finds out a trick about the other and then they fall down, which is ultimately intensely boring. Uh, for me, one of the, there have been a number of successful fight scenes. Uh, the one I think of first is uh, Spider-Man 2, the train sequence, mm -hmm. uh, where he's fighting oh, yeah. the octopus and there's this whole momentum about the danger, his efforts, the people helping him, that just carries you through the whole thing. And the people who've been best at that, Josh Whedon can be pretty good, but uh, I forgot the name of the uh, brothers who directed, uh, you know, the last two Captain America movies. Uh, yeah, I know who you're talking about. What is in there? Those guys, you know. Those guys. Uh, Winter Soldier. If you look at the fight scenes in Winter Soldiers, something's going on. There's like a beginning and end and a middle to them. It's not just punching each other. It's Captain America forcing his way through uh, walls to get yeah. to somebody on the other side. There's a great visual component. There's a great story component. Uh, you know, the same is true of like, you know, decent James Bond movies or any kind of great mm. movie uh, from you know, Asian cinema all the way around the world. So there's, uh, you know, and then on the other hand, you'll get, you'll get something where it's just, uh, you know, two guys throwing each other at one another, like in... Uh, well, probably the first Spider-Man movie is kind of like that. Whenever he fights the, the Green Goblin, uh, sure, Batman, sure. Batman versus Superman didn't do. Oh well. yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. You know, yeah. they're just little people going after the big bad guy at the end and throwing things. Yeah. Um, so that I think is an incredibly missed opportunity. And I, I don't want you uh, in Civil War. Mm -hmm. uh, I thought the fight scene at uh, you know the airport was utterly brilliant because not yes. only did it have all those intelligent elements. I felt like I was sitting back and flipping through some of my favorite Marvel comic book covers for the last oh, yeah. you know, 30 years because they, they did this, they did this, they did this. So they were incredibly smart about what made the comic books work in the first place. Mm -hmm. And I mean, come on, these characters have been written for, for 40 years, but you still have Hollywood idiots, you know, and <laughs> just thinking, oh, I can do better. You know, this has been through these characters have been through this experimental process with hundreds of writers. And if you don't take a look at the best of what they're doing and understanding why that works and how that works, you shouldn't go near the project. Creatively, anyhow, yeah. you know, but that's that seldom wins out in the world. <laughs> yeah, true enough, true enough. So if you were going to be able to write uh, and have control over a comic book movie, who would you? what characters would you be using? What, what would the storyline be like? Wow. Um, that is a really tough question. I honestly, I have no idea. Because you know some of my you know uh, some of my favorite characters aren't the ones that necessarily lend themselves to stories, <laughs> to good mm -hmm. stories. I'm very mm -hmm. fond of Dead Man, but you know he's dead, <laughs> and, he, he <laughs> and he inhabits people. What do you do with that? I, I'd have to really sit down and think about that. 
Sure, sure, yeah. sure. But so I, I honestly don't have a I don't have an answer for that one. Well, that's okay. Not, not having an answer is it five minutes well, and then I'll ring the screen. But yeah. okay. <laughs> so I, I saw that you wrote Captain America: Dark Design, talking about dark, you know Captain America and everything. Mm -hmm. So so when you're writing that, does Marvel come to you with an outline and say we want you to to flesh this out, or do you do you did you write a proposal for them? I mean, how did that work out? I uh, way back in the '90s when there was the Epic Illustrated line. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember Epic Illustrated. Yeah, sure. I was after first publishing went out of business. I was not writing comic books for a long time. I was kind of oddly enough, I was the Barton Fink of comics. I kept I was making a living <laughs> writing comic book scripts, but uh, the company would go out of business before they were published. So I had something like I don't know 30 scripts I'd written and characters that I'd been paid for but hadn't sold. Uh, anyway, but one of the ones that was resold that I originally wrote for first publishing was uh, Lance Barnes' Post Nuke Dick, which is about a detective who uh, has to uh, stop an ICBM from starting World War III, and he has to cut the green wire, the red wire, and he cuts the wrong wire, and the world ends, and now he's wandering the post-nuclear holocaust uh, with his one-legged one secretary named Peg. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> and that was published uh, through Epic through Marie Jaden. And uh, Marie apparently remembered me <laughs> because mm -hmm. about was it maybe a year ago, two years ago, she put my name up for the Deadpool novel. Oh, yeah. Which uh, Stuart Moore then uh, contacted me about. Mm -hmm. So I got that assignment from them. And to go back to the details of your question, they don't mm -hmm. give you a plot. Uh, I proposed, From that point, I proposed the plot. Okay. And then that there was a little back and forth on that. And then I you know, went on to draft and, you know, they, by and large, they really liked it. And then, uh, you know, three months later, it's like, do you want to do a Captain America novel? So that's where that came from. Pretty cool. I asked to do Doctor Strange, but they already gave that to somebody. <laughs> have, have you seen the new movie? Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm catching it tomorrow with the kids. I'm, okay. I'm pretty I, I, I have mixed feelings about it. Oh, you have mixed feelings. Do you um, want to talk about it without giving away any spoilers? Uh, let's see if I can. I found Benedict Cumberpatch's uh, American accent annoying okay. about the first 20 minutes. Then it grew on me as he engaged in conversation with the Ancient One. I mm -hmm. think it sucks that the Ancient One is being played by a, a, a white uh, woman. But <laughs> not that the Ancient One is being played by a woman, but, you know, there are so few great roles in those films for, for uh, you know, various other people that I find mm -hmm. that irritating. But that said, she does a fine job. Sure. Um, the plot was kind of you know, good guy versus bad guy. The effects were gorgeous, so that yeah. carries a lot of it. And, uh, you know, it wasn't the best and it wasn't the worst of what Marvel's mm -hmm. done. Visually, sure. it was very different. And I uh, was happy to see it on an XD screen that was not 3D, that was just XD, and mm -hmm. it looked gorgeous. And I, but I could see, I could see it looking cheesy on a smaller screen. All right, all right. Do you think with some movies they just use too much CGI and that kind of takes away from the story? Depends on what they do with the CGI. You can tell brilliant stories with CGI. You know, that goes back to the just throwing things at each other and understanding right, the right. Of the frame. I don't think there's anything wrong with CGI per se. Sure, sure, sure. So who would be your top five favorite characters in terms of comic books? Brother Power the Geek. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, I wrote eight issues of Brother Gar Power of the Geek. That was part of my Barton Fink days that were never published. Um, <laughs> who else? Uh, I, I, yeah, it's tough because it changes so much. I mean, I'm, I've read so much Spider-Man recently that I like I like him a lot now. I sure. read, uh, I read, um, you know, I was reading a ton of Deadpool when I did that, so I was really into him. Uh, I can tell you that characters who tend to be uh, too goody two shoes yeah. and don't have any internal conflict. Uh, you know, Captain America was tough to write. Uh, so I don't know that I would call him my favorite, but I think I, I, I tried to do him justice. Nobody's done Superman well. Uh, it's easier mm. for me to pick the characters I, I don't like. <laughs> mm, mm. Interesting. Than, than Interesting. Than it, the, than, it, the, than it is the ones I do. Uh, I don't understand why the hell the Black Widow doesn't have a goddamn action figure. Um, uh, but having some sort of internal drive is appealing and I think necessary rather than having them be sort of a symbol of something. Sure, sure. Bloodless. So, uh, ad adored Watchmen. Uh, oh yeah, yeah. Who would have thought they'd be able to have like uh, Big Blue Dick go through all that movie, man? 
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was surprised. It's like, how did this happen? <laughs> I know I, the, people don't like the director. What's his name? Zach, somebody. Yeah. But I thought Watchmen was, was, you know, he stuck so closely to the comic. I thought it worked fantastic. Or yep. as well, as well as that could have worked. <laughs> Yeah, 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 yeah. The ending still stings. Alan Moore and Moore's ending stunk, and you know they kind of worked with it a little in the movie. But <laughs> how would you change the ending? Well, he probably kind of painted himself in a corner. I mean, that goes back to the whole outlining thing. Mm. But I don't know that if there was an exterior threat that the United States would be, you know, that the world would suddenly come together and say, "Oh, we have an external enemy." Half of us would be saying, "Hmm, how can I appeal to that external enemy?" You know, if you saw a V or something like that, where you had the human collaborators and stuff. Oh yeah, well that's that's true. You know, humans, uh, so, we're a very odd species. So there would be definitely people. I doing don't that. buy the basic premise that an external threat would necessarily unite us, unless it could not be on any level reasoned with. That's interesting. I've heard that if you like the characters enough, people will forgive plot problems like that. Oh, I, I adore I, I Watchmen's a great adaptation. And I, I mentioned Watchmen is one of the things I like most. But... <laughs> yeah, 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 right, 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 right. I'm not going to say it's perfect because it's not. I mean, the perfect, <laughs> thing, the perfect thing has everything. You know? Right, right, right. So you were talking about um, doing some research or reading through a lot of comics about the character that you're doing a graphic novel about how much do you submerge you do you have a, a tendency of saying to yourself i need to write i have to read this amount of comics on like deadpool before uh, I as start much as doing graphic novel. Yeah. yeah as much as possible if it's somebody else's character until I, that's how I, I i i flood myself to get a sense of the voice and that's partly an intellectual and partly a like a uh oh what's the word i'm looking for muscle memory <laughs> muscle memory, right? I want to develop a muscle memory about the characters, so I read as much about it as I can. I make intellectual decisions of what I think works about them and doesn't. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. One of you know, one of my original novels, Ripper, took place in uh, 19th century uh, New York City. You know, we sure. got Jack the Ripper showing up there, and I read tons of uh, tons of history before I started that. And as I was writing it, I had all these maps from the 19th century, and I was plotting out where the characters were. You know, I didn't necessarily use all that. Right. But it, it helped informed it, and, I, and I, you know, it's also a way of picking out the best the best stuff. Sure, you know, sure. At that panel, I, I said a couple of times, stealing is great, and I don't necessarily mean that stealing is great. But if you understand why something works for you, you can better able you're better able to to make your own stuff work for others. Sure, sure. That's un yeah, yeah. That makes sense. So, so here, here's a loaded question. What is more important, having a really good idea or being able to execute a meh kind of idea? Huh. Being able to execute. Yeah. Ideas are easy. Uh, I when you have, when <laughs> have an idea, list, make, you know, makes lists side by side of your favorite films and favorite books, or list your favorite horror movies next to your favorite science fiction movies, and then write the words meets in between. And, uh, you know, the Flintstones meets Alien. You know, uh, <laughs> there's an idea. You know, a lot of those ideas you'll find out have been done already. Yeah. So while I'm occasionally impressed by uh, what seems like a great idea that I hadn't come up with, and I'll go, ooh, that's good. Uh, yeah. By and large, it's about, the, it's about the execution and going, you know, as I said earlier, about finding those moments that make it real. And we're talking purely about, you know, the idea now, the, the, yeah. the concept, which is very like, you know, like I said, the Flintstones meets aliens, the, whose perspective it's told from, how you do the Flintstones, how you do the alien, you know, those are all uh, important creative questions that can go in a dozen, a thousand different ways. Mm -hmm. When you're writing villains, what is there a uh, particular trick that you use or a method or, or a process to make the villains uh, pop off the page? They think they're right. Yeah. You know, they have their own perspective. They have their own belief. It just goes to a place that uh, <laughs> you would be uncomfortable going. Uh, Hannibal Lecter in Silence of the Lambs is the good serial killer <laughs> in that movie. You know, and you, you admire him, or you, you secretly do, uh, but can't identify with him completely because he only eats people who you would tend to think are rude too. <laughs> you don't like, you know, it's like... If you know somebody had cuts you off in traffic or does something incredibly rude, uh, there's a we're predators. So part of us is thinking, gee, I'd like to get out of the car and eat him, you know, <laughs> or do damage to him in some other way. But we're held held back 
by either rationality or spirituality or the law. Oh. <laughs> and, you know, one of the reasons I think uh, horror is popular or the battle things are, are popular because that, they appeal to that predatory side. That's, you know, part of our nature for a quarter of a million years. Sure. Since yeah. we stood up. So those parts of your brain are going to flare up. Mm. When you're writing dialogue for for a comic book, for a graphic novel, how is it is it difficult for beginning writers to kind of like I don't know maybe maybe put like what you want the character to say into what is for all intents and purposes a tweet? I mean, you don't have a lot of you, you know. I mean, because that's how I feel. I mean, that's when I look when I'm looking when I'm reading through a comic. It's like it's like they're tweeting basically. They're trying to cram in a lot of information or at least a lot of feelings. Yes. Um, but in a limited space. Yes. Well, that goes back to the whole notion of writing queries and being and being concise and, and you know, understanding the power of individual words. I, I, I teach a I, I sometimes teach a class just on, on writing comics. And one of the and it's based on Scott McCloud's brilliant book, Making Comics, which everyone, mm -hmm. everyone should buy, whether they're interested in comics or not. But one of the exercises I do in that class is I, I you know, pick a simple phrase like good morning. And then write it the way four different or five different characters would say that. Like, you know, an introvert would sort of mumble it or not say it at all. An extrovert would scream it. You know. Interesting. Uh, 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 someone selfish would say, why don't you ask me how my morning is? <laughs> so those are all sm a small number of words, but you can make them sound like they're in a, in a uh, you know, in a given character's voice. And it's, it, it's, it's one of the key things that to, to, uh, that makes comic books successful, because unlike film or television, when you're reading a comic book, the only voice is yours. Yeah. I mean, you can pretend you're talking like the Thing or Spider Woman or whatever, but it's still you doing that voice. You know, and some people, you know, you might have the you know, the movie star's name uh, voice in your head, but by and large, it's just you talking to yourself. So while an actor can say the uh, mm. a thousand different ways, when you're writing it. You have to make it, you know, you have to use whatever opportunities you can to express that character's personality and situation in those words. Sure. And, you know, it's possible people write haiku. You know? Yeah, yeah, this is true. You, you got a hell of a lot to like, study haiku, you know, if you want to see how much you can see in a short space. But, it, yeah, of course, it's key. I mean, movie dialogue is um, uh, you know, also a similar one, but there at least you've got the actor. So you can get away with it, tons of things. Right, right. I always, and I've written a couple of scripts in my time, and and I always thought that script writing. I was part of Harvard Square script writers for a number of years, and I always thought that um, it's more akin to poetry in a sense, huh. you know, being able to to condense the imagery into the uh, into very short short lines of yeah. dialogue. But in a movie script, you have the advantage of being able to mention other movies. <laughs> oh, yeah, this is true. <laughs> because you've got your, uh, you walks into a compound like the Godfather, you know, and you're done. <laughs> right, 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 uh, right. Because right. The, the audience is key. You know, that goes back to the comic book script thing. You're writing to your artist if you're just a writer or, or only, the, not, not even only, if you're the writer and you're working with an artist, you're writing to the writer. And if you develop a rapport with them, you can say, you know, hey, Charlie, do this face like you did then or, you know, give me some mm. Kirby forced perspective or, or whatever. So there's that shorthand you can develop too. Sure, sure. What is it like to work with? I imagine that every single artist that has uh, that works with a writer, it, it takes time and effort to to build a relationship between those those people. Um, is there a secret? Is there a secret to to getting of, along? A, a lot of it's you know some of it's just time, some of it's just chemistry. Um, in terms of a secret, when I first started writing Squalor, my, my, my scripts were not as bad as Alan Moore's script, where if you've ever seen the script for Watchmen, he takes up a page just talking about the first panel uh, mm -hmm. and having this weird flow of conscious stuff. Uh, my, my first scripts for Squalor that I, I did with Tom Sutton were incredibly dense, and yeah. a lot of it worked really well, and he found this terribly amusing. Uh, <laughs> He's a, he's a, I love talking to Tom, um, and I learned I learned a lot from him, and and he he followed it, and 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 it was one of those wonderful matches where he not only knew exactly what I was looking for based on my description, he he added to it, so it, the pictures were very much mm. his, 
as well as being my script. Whereas, you know, uh, some artists, you can describe things until you're blue in the face and they, you know, they'll potentially just ignore it or, or you know, do something yeah. uh, completely different. Part of the secret for me as I, as I went on is that I tended, you know, especially when meeting somebody for the first time or working with an artist for the first time is not to give them angles and too much direction about what the picture should look like, but focus on the content. Like rather than say close up of glass of water, just say, you know, glass of water with the ice and the, you know, moisture dripping along the side. And they're not gonna, odds are they're not gonna draw it as a long shot, you know, so right. it's like across the street or something like that. And <laughs> when you do that, I think you're more actively engaging their creativity and storytelling ability because you really do want that to be a collaboration. And you want, you don't want to, you know, uh, overshadow them, first of all, because they won't like it, uh, because it's mm -hmm. not like you, you want to be an artist. But second of all, because you want their creativity to work with yours. Sure. Uh, not sure. against it. You know, odds are they'll come up with stuff that, you know, if you give them the right idea, they'll come up with stuff you you, you didn't imagine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what one piece of advice would you give to beginning writers? <laughs> don't quit your day job. <laughs> <laughs> You know, but seriously, if you're planning on making a living as a writer, uh, 99 out of 10, I mean, one person will automatically become incredibly successful, but the other 99 just won't. And uh, you need a way to support yourself. And if it's something you're doing planning to do to make money at, don't. There's lots better ways to make money. And uh, if you don't want to be a writer, you know, don't do it. I, I, you go to these writing classes and such where they want to inspire you to complete your work. And you, have to, you don't have to do any of that. You don't have to write a novel. You don't have to write a short story. You don't have to write anything. Do it because you want to do it. Yeah, and it's almost like the Star Trek quote, Ricardo Montalbán: you know, "Do, do it because you want to, or don't." You know? uh, <laughs> so, yeah, that's part of the advice. The other advice is the whole speech I gave about redundancy. You know? Yeah, seek, seek clarity. Uh, it's great to follow your muse and throw up on the page and have a ton of words, but figure out what you're trying to say consciously. Uh, and for a lot of people, that you know, it's like telling a centipede how to walk. Yeah. <laughs> You know, get stuck in a ditch trying to figure out which foot goes where. But while that's painful at first and in some ways debilitating, learning it is 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 key to being able to successfully, you know, maybe not learn a living, but at least communicate. Yeah, you know, sure. Uh, uh, as a writer, and it certainly increases your chances of, of building up an audience. So you know, uh, don't do it if you don't want. What's to. What's the trick to building up an audience? I mean, you must have hell if I know. fans. You must have fans, <laughs> Stefan, with your long career. I mean, is there besides punching out incredible content? Is there anything else? Actually, punching out incredible content doesn't always work, and mm. sometimes punching out crappy content works really well. One of the things we do in my class is uh, you know, the first exercises in the writing class is pick something you really think stinks that was incredibly successful, and try to figure out why it succeeded. The other thing, pick something you love that bombed yeah. and yeah. and try to figure out why it bombed. Uh, because those those uh, there is the self-expression aspect where you can write something absolutely gorgeous that no one else would give a shit about. And somebody else yeah. can sit down and do something that you think is pure problem and sell 50 million copies. You know, you can probably oh, guess yeah. some of the books that come up on the hated list. Uh, you know, <laughs> right. Everybody. I thought I read... I, I read through the first Twilight book, I, you know, confession. That's, I guess that's like a hashtag mm -hmm. confession right there. You know, I read through the first one and I said to myself, you know, I think I understand how a tween girl thinks from this. And, and I didn't mean it as an insult to the author, but she knew exactly who her audience was. She, she, you know, I mean, I, I didn't like yeah. the book, but it's like, well, if you're writing it for a certain demographic, then it's spot on. Yeah, I mean, I don't know that it made me understand how a tween girl thinks, but I could see where it would, I, I could see how it would appeal to that. And I'm not, you know, those things that people think are bad, I don't think are bad. I don't think Twilight is bad. I mean, except perhaps for, you know, e even in the escapist sense of having the, the, the uh, passive woman and the yeah, yeah, yeah. male, um, the social aspect, but I think, you know, half of romance is that. For you know, all sorts of people, you know, mostly women, and and there's a, there's an escapist fantasy involved that doesn't necessarily reflect your politics per se. Uh, so, sure. it, quality and uh, you know there's a certain amount of quality that's important. You got to write in English sentences or something akin to them, and understand grammar and some sense of plot structure. I think to to get into the lottery. But after that, a lot of it is it is a lottery. 
yeah. uh, as to whether some it has to be done at the right time with the right tone. Somebody has to buy it. You know, some yeah. of my the, some of my favorite works sold squat. Uh, some of my favorite works I can't sell. Some of the things I, I'm thinking like, meh, you know, I'm still getting royalty checks. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, you know, writers love to think, artists love to think that quality sells, that quality will out. Uh, yeah. J.K. Rowling was rejected 13 times, you know? Uh, yeah. And if she hadn't submitted that 14th time, it, you know, who knows, and who knows how many other, you know, books out there are like that. So, uh, quality and marketability are not and never will be the same thing. The relationship on the Venn diagram is not a one-to-one -one thing. Yes, if you'd like to put it that way. There is overlap, yeah. you know, the Beatles. There is overlap, right, <laughs> but there are, there are distinct uh, areas that, that do not touch each other. Yeah. So, Stefan, we're coming up to an hour of our cool. conversation here. And this is what I generally ask our guests, is that if there's anything you wanted me to ask you, but I didn't, if there's any topic you want to talk about, this is this is the time. We'll talk about plugs afterwards, but if there's something that yeah. is really burning inside you that you want to talk about or anything that we haven't touched on, this is it. This is the time. No, man. I'm like, uh, this is like that, what superhero would you like to direct topic? I'm like, uh... <laughs> I'm burnt out talking about the election. <laughs> oh, the election. Oh, my no, friend, no, yeah. No, 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 no. I, I, I stayed away from Facebook. <laughs> oh, that's smart. That's because smart. That. Uh, so uh, there isn't anything in particular I'd like you to ask. Uh, I would like to figure out which superhero I'd like to direct. <laughs> be able to raise mm -hmm. anybody mm -hmm. more that I think only I can handle and should handle. Uh, <laughs> you know, there have been those things I've said, oh, me, let me do that. Because I'd be great at it, you know, and that goes back to uh, the X Files comic. Oh yeah. Uh, because I saw that I've always been fascinated by the paranormal. Don't necessarily believe, mm -hmm. it, but I, I I I love the genre and the machination. Oh, I'm with you on that. Sure, and, definitely. And when the first episode of the X Files aired, I was like, I gotta do the comic book for this. And I called Jim Solkrup up because he was looking for titles. He was over at Topps Comics. No people. That's another way. Mm -hmm. to say no people. Uh, no people. I, yeah. So Jim Solkrup, um and said, "You got to get the rights for this. You got to get the rights for this." And I, I, I probably wasn't the only one telling him that, but uh, I think he was trying to get Peter David to write it, but Peter passed. So that's how I got that. So I, I certainly I connected to that. But <laughs> as to what questions to ask me, you know, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, fantastic. Where can people find you online? Talk about where you, they can uh, sign up for your courses. Uh, Petruca dot com has uh, links. Uh, my courses are at UMass, University of Massachusetts and Amherst. They're available online, also through Universities Without, Without Walls. Uh, you know, look, looking my name up should get you Facebook and Twitter. Twitter, it's at S. You know, Facebook, I have three websites, one devoted to my zombie detective, uh, Hesius Man, Dead Man Walking. And uh, it should be pretty easy to find. Uh, in terms of promotion, uh, you know, buy my, buy my Spider-Man novel when it comes out. When is that coming out, friend? When yeah, is that coming? When's the movie coming out? I think it's coming out around the same time, probably June or something like that. Right. Um, Do we have a title for it? For the Spider-Man Forever Young. Oh, hey, how about that? Half of it's a uh, reimagining of the uh, the tablet story from the uh, heyday of Stan Lee and John Romita in the '60s, and the other half is a sort of quasi sequel to that. So it cool. sort of traces both the uh, uh, straddles the adaptation versus new storyline thing. Oh, I'm uh, looking forward to reading it. Excellent, thank you. Yeah, man. Well, hey, it's been a lot of fun. I'm not going to lie to you. Me neither. All right, so I'm going to. No, hey. <laughs> so I'm going to do a technical thing right now. I'm going to don't don't get off the line yet. I'm going to hit the stop recording button, and then okay. the caster will magically upload all of our conversations on the uh, our files onto my drop.